every marriage, relationships, communication is a challenge. They tell us there are about six different dynamics that can occur in a communication process. There's what you mean to say, 
Then there's what you actually say. There's what the person heard you say. And then there's what they think you said. And then there's what they go and tell somebody else that you said. And then there's what you go and tell somebody else that you said. And it seems like those six things don't always gel. It's a challenge. We hear comments, for example, Sermon on the Mount has nothing to do with riding horses. <laughs> nothing. You read in the scripture that John the Baptist tragically was beheaded and his head was served up on a platter to the king. Now you ask yourself, is that food for thought? <laughs> oh, now that was bad, wasn't it? <laughs> See, this is my point. Communication is tough. It's tough. Then we come to the point now of dealing with this dynamic of love. And communicating love is a challenge. You know it's a challenge. Particularly if you're married. Now, Queenie and I, we never have any communication issues. At least I don't. Now, Queenie does. She doesn't seem to understand what I say. I'll say one thing, and she, she interprets it as if she lives in a completely different country, speaking a completely different language. And my frustration level goes up. You know what it's like. We, we go to the Lord about sometimes our marital issues because we can't seem to get on the same page and we think that we think that God actually sets up scenarios that create frustration. We have a wife who is over here praying Lord please help him to get rid of that one track mind. And the husband over here, Lord, please help her not to be so cold. And you think, is this some divine scheme to wreck marriages that they can't get on the same page? I noticed nobody was laughing there. They're saying, uh-oh, now he's starting to get personal. This, we got to get rid of him. I've noticed this a lot in marriages where we'll say things like, you know, if you loved me, you would. Or if you loved me, you wouldn't. And we spell it out. And what happens is, when we function in that manner, we tend to define love in a very selfish way. In other words, love is all about what makes me feel good. It's not necessarily about me giving. Here in this skeleton of righteousness that the Lord laid out to us in 2 Peter chapter 1, we're the flesh and the blood that go on this skeleton. It's interesting that the capstone of that, it culminates with love. Love is not just some warm, fuzzy feeling or an emotion or a whim or a passion. Love is a decision, a decision of the will based on a commitment of the heart. Christ demonstrated that to us in many, many ways. Let's look at our passage in 2 Peter. If you have your Bible, you can open to 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning with verse 5. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. And to goodness, knowledge. And to knowledge, self-control. And to self-control, perseverance. And to perseverance, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly affection. And to brotherly affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your walk with Jesus Christ. These do not suddenly culminate in your life and you're done. They are ever increasing. Lord, as we look at these dynamics of love, 
I'm struck again with the limitations of human speech and even my inability to fully comprehend the depths of your love. I pray, Lord, that your spirit would take the words and take even those words and drive it deep into our hearts. Teach us, we pray, in Christ's name. Amen. When he comes and he says, add to godliness brotherly affection, the Greek word that's used there is phileo. We are more familiar with it because uh, Philadelphia. Anybody been to Philadelphia? Uh, Delphos, brother, the city of brotherly love. Now, Philadelphia has a similar issue that we do. They don't live up to their name. If you've been to Philadelphia, you got to watch where you go. It's not necessarily the city of brotherly love. And it's interesting that the church, while we wear that label, and I'm speaking of the greater church, we don't always demonstrate the kind of love that Christ expects of us. We often put all kinds of conditions and everything around it. Epictetus was a Stoic philosopher. And uh, frankly, he was very selfish. He thought a lot of himself. And one thing about Epictetus, he never married, never had kids, didn't want anything to do with that. Because he felt like if he, if he happened to be uh, tied to somebody, that would mess him up. That would encumber him. And he made this statement, and I quote, he said, How can someone who has to teach mankind take the time to find something to heat the water in which to give the baby a bath? Very arrogant. Very selfish. But I want us to see something in that. Because there's something wrong with any religion that finds the demands of relationship to be too much. Now all of us here have relationships of all kinds. Friends and family. People at work. And you admit that they're not always easy. I mean, we run into clashes. We have disagreements. You have misunderstandings. Sometimes your feelings run pretty hot. And sometimes you don't even want to relate to some people. You just want to go to work and hide under your desk or hide somewhere in the corner. You get off so nobody has to talk to you or be with you. How do you demonstrate? How do we demonstrate brotherly affection, brotherly love? if we isolate ourselves away from people. I have been struck with relationships I've built in various countries with people that I barely knew and their kindness to me and they were not even believers often bowled me over. You know that I lead trips to Israel and I remember on one particular trip that we had our bus driver, a Muslim, Marwan, he, he said to us one time, he says, hey, we had a small group that time. We had like 19 people. He says, I want to swing you by my house and introduce you to my family. We, we went by his house. We went in. He, he prays out his daughters. He had them all dressed up. He was so proud. And then he said, come with me. And he led us into another room where they had prepared a whole feast for us. I thought, wow. What drives you to do this? Why can you express this kind of love for us? I think about Sophia in Kosovo. And there were just a group of five of us. Five men. And they were in civil war, if you recall. And uh, we stayed at the home of a surgeon there in Kosovo. His house had been burned. He had lost almost all that he had. The house where we stayed with him had a living room, a kitchen, a bedroom, and a bath. They were very tiny. They were not believers. And they welcomed us into their home where we slept 
but they fed us. When we were there, the weather was awful. It was rainy. The streets were muddy. Our shoes were absolutely gross and covered with mud every at the end of every day. And every morning when we would get up, our shoes had been cleaned and polished by Sophia. What causes that kind of love? I think sometimes we are so busy with our lives that we don't always extend the kind of love and grace and mercy to those around us because it's a bother. It's just, it, it takes us away from what we think we need to do. In America, we've become very uh, cocoonish. You know, we stay in our homes. We don't see tons of people walking the streets or just taking walks or getting out, except on parade day. That's a different dynamic. And unfortunately, some churches become the same way. Now again, I want to remind you, anything negative I say does not reflect on us, because we're not that way. We are flawless and or perfect. There are some churches that will not help anybody outside of their own walls. You have a need? If you go to church here, we'll help you. If not, I'm sorry, we can't help you. You got a death in your family? You want a dinner? You go to church here? No, I'm sorry, we can't help you. What do we have all these kids running around? Where are their parents? Their parents aren't going to be here. They, they don't need to come. They're disruptive. They're messing up the building. I think I've told you before, I, I, I've been stunned through the years at people complaining about kids that are present because they marked a wall. I think God takes pictures of those marks and is thrilled with them. In, in most of the churches that I pastored, we always had a daycare. And I, I promise you, every Monday I had an issue. With daycare people coming in and fussing that somebody had used their paper, their construction paper, their scissors or whatever, and fussed about those Sunday school people. And every Sunday, the Sunday school teachers came in and fussed about the daycare people that used their paper. And I, I pulled them all together one time. I said, have any of you noticed that we had kids here? Who cares if everybody uses everybody's stuff? We're not here to protect that stuff. We're here to protect these kids and to love them and to point them to Christ. What are we about? It's easy to get focused on trying to preserve stuff that doesn't last. People are eternal. Either in heaven or in hell. I don't want people to be eternal in hell. That's why we share the gospel. That's why we tell people about Jesus. That's why we are passionate about the call that God has put on our lives. We need to begin to demonstrate love to one another. One of the ways that we can do that is we compliment one, in, one another. Now by compliment, I don't, I don't mean just saying nice things, hey, you look good or whatever. I mean, those are nice compliments too. But we need to compliment, P-L-E compliment, that is, we complete one another. Instead of me complaining about somebody's weaknesses, I need to look and see how the people around me actually strengthen my weaknesses. You have strengths and abilities that I don't possess. In my relationship with you, you actually make me stronger. We make each other look good when we compliment one another. We need to listen to one another. Do you know why some people don't listen? Because listening means you have to assume some level of responsibility in what you hear. So if somebody comes to you and they unload a problem, it doesn't necessarily mean they want you to fix it, but they want you to respond in some manner that demonstrates some compassion, some understanding. And so often we don't listen because we don't want the emotional drain on our lives. Do we possess this brotherly affection that says, I will listen? We know... We need to look for ways to build one another up. 
not tear each other down. Ways that if I see you stumbling, I can, I can pick you up. And when you see me stumble, you can pick me up. Rather than we take the time to judge or condemn one another, we need each other. That's the body. That's brotherly love in action. We need to pray that the Lord gives us a burden for people that don't know Christ. Now, now ask yourself, be honest with yourself. Do we really genuinely care about people that don't know Christ? Is the fact that someone is living and spiritually lost, does that matter to you? If it doesn't, we need to say, Lord, give me a burden like this. Help me to hurt like you hurt. We often pray, Lord, I want to love like you love, but the truth is, we can't love like Christ loves until we hurt like He hurts. But that's not, that's not something that's appealing to us. We don't like to move away from what we're comfortable with. There was a guy who was very ill, and he went, went to see the doctor, and the doctor examined him. He went through a bunch of tests. He says, look, he says, you, doctor says to him, he says, you are in bad shape. So here's the deal. He says, you need to talk to your wife and have her fix more nutritious meals for you. And you're going to have to have her kind of pull the kids back a little bit because your stress level is going high. It's affecting you. And you're under financial pressure. You're going to have to set a budget. You're going to have to live with it. You're going to have to tell your wife you got to live with this budget. If you don't take these steps, you're going to be dead in a month. He said, Doc, um, I appreciate what you're saying. He said, would you call my wife and tell her that? I think it would be more official coming from you. So I'll do it. So okay. So the guy leaves the office and he drives home. When he gets home, his wife meets him at the door and she's sobbing. She said, oh, honey, I just talked to the doctor. I'm so sorry. You're going to be dead in 30 days. <laughs> What's he saying? I'm not going to change. Listen, this is what's tragic. There will be people that will be dead, literally, in 30 days. And there are people in the church around the United States who really don't care. All they'll say is, oh, you'll be dead in 30 days. Where is the love that moves us off of our apathetic duffs and say, Lord, I'll do what you called me to do. To godliness, add brotherly affection, and then he caps it off into brotherly affection, love. Agapao, agape as we call it. The highest form of love. A love that there's no conditions. It's the kind of love that God has for us. It's the kind of love that He has for those who come to Him. It's the kind of love He has for those who don't come to Him. It's agape love that knows no boundaries. It's easy when we learn that Bible verse, for God so what? Loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That's an easy verse to quote. Do we understand the depth of it? We've talked often about the Scripture in Romans. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It wasn't waiting till we came over to His side. Can you imagine the story of the feeding of the 5,000? What a phenomenal event. Can you imagine if Jesus, just as they're getting ready to pass out the bread and the fish, if he said, now, whoa, before we pass this out, I need to know who was in synagogue last Sabbath. Because if you weren't in synagogue, you can't eat any of this. Didn't do 
knew that, did he? His love, he just said, hey, do you have a need? I'm here to meet it. You come to me. Come to me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. It is a love that is mind-boggling. And, and frankly, I stand here before you, and I tell you about this, and I feel incredibly shallow in my understanding of this kind of love. Because it's a kind of love that's not just for friends. It's a kind of love that's also for enemies, for people you don't love. Now listen to me carefully. Our capacity for loving God is only as great as the person we love the least. Our capacity for loving God is only as great as the person we love the least. It's very challenging. That's why he talks about in this skeleton of righteousness that we have to make sure that we continue to add, that our love continues to expand. Because it's a love of choice. It's an act of the will that stems from a commitment of the heart. Well, what decisions can we make? What can we give? We can give unconditional love and acceptance by the grace of God. We can give understanding. We can give no condemnation. We can give forgiveness. We can give something that is not innate to us, but it comes by the power of God's Holy Spirit. Dr. Mike Fullingham is a friend of mine. He, he teaches uh, Oklahoma Western University, but for many years he was a missionary in Papua New Guinea. If you're familiar with Papua New Guinea, it's a very primitive country. And Mike tells a story. He says, one night, he said, when I was there, he said, we were kind of out under the stars. He said it was a bright night. The stars were clear. And he said the moon was just this huge white ball in the sky. And he said, we're sitting there. And he said, without thinking, I didn't think through what I was about to say. It popped out of my mouth. He said, I pointed to the moon and I said, we've been there and walked there. Now you've got to understand, this is Papua New Guinea. They're about as close to prehistoric as you can get. When he said we've been to the moon, there was no comprehension of what he just said. That was completely out of their scope of reality. And, he, and Mike said, once I said it, he said, I was stuck. I couldn't pull it back. He said, I kept trying to explain it to them. And he said, it just made no sense. He said, then they asked me two key questions coming out of their context. They said, okay. And they called him Red Man. He said, okay, Red Man. He said, if you've been there, who was the first one there? Was it the Catholics or the Lutherans? <laughs> Why would they ask that? Look at the missionaries that came to them. The second question was, Why did you go there? And then he named the three things that were of utmost importance to the Papua New Guineans. He said, did you go for pigs, sweet potatoes, or women? Now, you know, we're no different in that we tend to look at what God has asked us to do and what He says. We look at it out of our context. And when we use words like brotherly affection and love, we think of them almost always in human terms. But the Scripture says that God is what? Love. So we can't really talk about love without involving Him because He is the essence of what the Word is. If we're going to have these characteristics added into our lives, we have to move out of our context and into the realm of God and live in His presence 
and ask to see through His eyes and to understand through His Spirit and to respond according to His commands until who we are and what we do reflects not the limitations of humanity, but begins to reflect and demonstrate the infinite love of God to all those around us. So for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. That zeal, that desire to do something for God and to goodness knowledge. Zeal alone won't cut it. You've got to know where to go and what to do. And to knowledge, self-control, the ability to keep your hands on the wheel, to be headed in the right direction. And the self-control, perseverance. The ability to stay the course. Regardless of the trials and the, and the tough spots. And the perseverance, godliness. Just because it's tough, because you're committed, we still demonstrate the character of Christ. And so if you're going to do that, you better make sure that you add brotherly affection and love. Are those characteristics at play in our lives? Remember, even when they're present, he says if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, so I always want to be saying, Lord, am I allowing you to expand who you are in me? No. I don't expand his essence, but he expands mine. Changing me. God has placed us on purpose right here in Alliance. Not just the church, but you, me. And so we say, Lord, I want this skeleton of righteousness to come alive in me so that as a body, we are changing our community. And we have so many fantastic ministries that are doing that. We saw people being baptized here tonight, or this morning, as a result of ministries that we have going. Be that demonstrate these characteristics. Will you stand with me? <laughs> Father, we love you very much. And when I think about this whole skeleton of righteousness, all these characteristics, any one of them alone can be overwhelming to us, and then you throw all of them out there and ask that they continue to be developing in our lives through your spirit. Lord, I pray that you would teach us, help us. Give us a kind of love that is not confined to human emotion, but the kind of love that grows out of decisions we make to follow you, a commitment of the heart that says we love you, and I pray that those around us will see you in us for your glory. We pray this in your most holy name. Amen.